just about 7.10 in the morning, and in about two minutes, train number 1501 of Pittsburgh and Lake Erie Railroad will be coming under the overpass, stopping here in Glen Willard to pick up passengers who board this train every morning to take it into Station Square in Pittsburgh so they can go on their way to their various jobs. The train starts in Beaver Falls, stops in Glen Willard, then continues on down the line, as it has done now for many, many years. However, today is the last time that train number 1501 will be stopping in Glen Willard, or as a matter of fact, anywhere else, because this is the last train ride. Because of a sagging economy and a lack of ridership, Pittsburgh and Lake Erie Railroad, after contemplating for many, many months, has decided that they will now stop that train run. People get on this train every morning. They go to various jobs in Pittsburgh. There's men, there's women, sometimes there's even kids that go to Pittsburgh with their parents. The passengers there feel very, very sad about the train being stopped, as does p and &E officials. TV14 got the opportunity, of course, to take the last train ride. We got a chance to talk with some p &E officials. Chuck Craig, the public relations director, who explained to us that although they would like to keep this train on as long as they possibly could, they just can't do it anymore. It used to be that there was five cars on the train. Now there's only three. Some 85 passengers only ride the train now between Beaver Falls and Pittsburgh. TV14 is bringing you the last train ride. We got a chance to get on board, ride it in, get up on the locomotive, and actually see what it is to ride this train into Pittsburgh. Our visit will include a trip to the old p &E Railroad Station, which is now the Grand Concourse Restaurant. We walked into Station Square, got a chance to talk once again with the officials of the railroad itself. So if you'd like to come along with us, we would like for you to board train number 1501 and take with us the last train ride.
passengers who come to Glen Willard every morning at 7.10 to board train number 1501 are very unhappy that this is the last time that they're going to be able to ride this train to Pittsburgh to their jobs. We got a chance to talk to a couple of them, and I think you'll hear their own stories. The one woman in particular has been riding this train for 15 years. I got to start in Glen Willard. And you ride the train on a regular basis then to Pittsburgh every day? Right. Now, of course, the train is going to be, they're going to take the run out, and as a, you know, passenger who's been doing this now for some time, how do you feel about them stopping it? It's, it's really going to be an inconvenience. I've, I drove before I knew the train was running, and it's, it's really a pain. It adds like an extra hour a day onto, onto my day. So what happens after, uh, after now, when the, when the train run is finally stopped, how do you get to Pittsburgh? I guess carpool. I try the options and probably carpool. Have you ridden the train very much in your life? I mean, do you, besides this one? Uh, well, I've ridden trains in Germany and England and New York. Man, this one. You like trains, though? Yeah, I do. Real convenient. How long have you been riding this train to Pittsburgh? At least 15 years. 15 years? Yes. Now, you're on the last ride. That's right. What, um, as a paying passenger for 15 years, what does that do to you? How do you feel about that? I'm very disappointed. And I feel very sad. Uh, it's a wonderful way to commute to work. I'm going to miss the train. I have no idea how I'm going to be getting to work other than taking the bus, which I really don't look forward to. Why do you think that rail service uh, is dwindling away in the United States? Europe, that seems everybody's doing good in Europe with trains. What do you think's wrong? I think the main reason is the fact that um, people are used to driving, getting in their cars, um, driving to work, the convenience of a car. Having to drive to the train station, um, whereas a bus stop is usually near a home, that type of thing. But as far as this one goes, you're going to miss it. Very much. Very disappointed that they're taking it off. The guys in the blue hats and blue coats, of course, they're called conductors, and train number 1501 has a pair of its own. Both guys have been working here for some 40 years for the railroad. They've been on this run for about five years apiece. We've got a chance to talk with the conductors, and one of them in particular says that he's kind of angry that they are going to be stopping train number 1501. And in some ways, he blames the government for not coming to p and rescue. Let's talk about what a conductor does first. What is a conductor? Well, conductor's in charge of the train, and the assistant conductor's there in case of emergency or to help. We're both actually conductors and ticket collectors, and uh, we discharge and uh, put the stools down for the people to get uh, on the train and get off the train. And. Uh, well, you got a lot of rules and regulations to remember, and you've got to remember all your bulletin orders and train orders and so forth. And Ed, you've been with pl &E for how long? Forty years, same as Mr. McNeely. Now, how long have you been on this run? Five years on passenger. Um, as a conductor, as a p and &E employee, how do you feel about them when they when they stop runs like this? Well, I say it's a shame that they should stop the run for the simple reason that it's going to inconvenience a lot of people and the fact that uh, the train has never been advertised, that, that's a bad thing because I think if it was ever advertised, I think this train would really do a whale of a business. <laughs> what, um, I suppose as a conductor, you're on this run for five years, you get to know people, don't you? Oh, I, uh, since I've been on here, or when I first started on here five years ago, a lot of the people didn't know one another. After I got on here, I, I don't know, I guess being a family man all my life, I've been the type that I like to have fun with people and joke around, kid around, and a lot of the people, I've learned their names, and, uh, a lot of them I know their first name and last name, and basically I know practically everybody by first name. Ed, 
What happens now when the last the last run? What does Ed Brooks do? Well, I guess I'll go back into yard service, switch yard freight, switch mills, set up the trains for road crews. That's about the extent of it. Why do you think that uh, passenger service has declined? What's the problem with the rail system? Federal government. <laughs> That's the only answer I can give you, the federal and the state government. They don't care, they have an attitude, they can send money overseas, but they can't take care of the people at home. That's the way I feel about it. Why do you think that in Europe the train is so big, and here in the United States it's just not doing anything? Well, your federal governments in Europe take care of their people. This government don't care. And I hate to be so blunt and so crude about it, but that's the way I see it. you've been on this run? Well, I've been on this about uh, four years, I'd say. It looks like it's a complicated thing. <laughs> well, how, do you, how do you run one of these? Well, it's mostly uh, through experience, you know. Uh, uh, it's not as complicated as it looks, but uh, passenger train is probably a little more complicated than most because of the passengers. Restricting. Uh, no, it's uh, most of it's experience, a lot of years, and uh, it's not really uh, that complicated. You kind of get used to the run. Now here it is, 1501, going from Beaver Falls to Pittsburgh on a daily basis. Um, how do you feel about it being stopped? Uh, would you repeat that again, please? Yeah, how do you feel about the uh, the run itself being stopped? You've been connected with this run now, and here you go. You're not going to make this run anymore. Does that? Um, how do you feel about that? Well, I I feel uh, sad for one thing. Uh, I it it is a nice job. I like I like the job because of uh, certain hours that regular hours, I should say. Also, uh, it's sad because it is one of the last that we, uh, in Pennsylvania, so I'm told. And plus, uh, I like working, uh, 
with the public and meeting him. I enjoy that. So what do you do after this? Well, I think I'll probably take uh, a road job, which is hauling freight. But uh, one thing about that, I'll be on call all the time, and I don't, I don't appreciate that too much. How does one get to become an engineer? Well, now I think uh, it's going to be... Uh, I'm just not sure how the PNLE would do it because we got so many laid off. But for myself, you start out as a fireman, and uh, then uh, it's sort of on-the-job training. And then, of course, you got to go through uh, different series of examinations, and uh, eventually, uh, when your seniority prevails, you uh, are allowed to. Uh, then you're set up to be an engineer after a few years. Me, it took quite a few years because of there was a lot of older uh, engineers at the time, so you had to wait your turn. when people come on in the morning you get to know faces don't you you know all the people but have any of the passengers related to you how they feel about the run being stopped yes quite a few uh, some of them are disappointed some of them uh, really want to stay on the train they of course you know they've gone to court to try to keep the train on so uh, quite a few feel bad about it and uh, some of them are going to reluctantly go to other means of transportation but uh, they'd like to the train back on well, what are you going to do well, I'll go back out in freight. I work uh, freight between uh, McKees Rocks and Youngstown. I did that 10 years before I come out here. So, uh, You've been with it 40 years. Why did you want to join the railroad? Well, my uh, family are railroaders. My father worked for the railroad. My brother-in-laws and several brothers worked for the railroad and uncles and uh, quite a few railroaders in the family. And when I come out of the Navy, I just come down here and hire out. Uh, it was in the blood. <laughs> and I'll say this, I've enjoyed it too for 40 years. I like my job. I like working the Padner Run. We have a lot of beautiful people on here. We get to know them on a first name basis. And uh, we'll miss them. 
and I'm sure they'll miss each other too because it's like a little family. So, uh, don't like to see the train go. I'm not in accounting, so the matter of economics, I don't know about, but I do know for the train that we have a little family here, and I hate to see it break up. It's like getting a divorce. So. During the heyday of its passenger service, which was roughly from 1910 to 1930, the Pittsburgh and Lake Erie mounted one of the East's heaviest passenger services on the 65-mile, four-track portion of its main line between Pittsburgh and Youngstown. Fifty passenger trains a day moved over this part of the railroad. There were also 14 trains a day over the two-track system, extending south to McKeesport and then branching via the Yokogany River to Connellsville, which was the original line, and then to Brownsville along the Monongahela River. At the peak of the service, there were four locals to Newcastle, seven to Brownsville, and two to Connellsville. Pittsburgh Passenger Station handled in excess of 60 trains per day, making it a busy place indeed. The timetable effective, June 16, 1907, introduced a through sleeping car, Pittsburgh to Muskoka Lakes, Ontario, operating via Toronto in connection with the Canadian Pacific. It left Pittsburgh at 12.35 p.m., arriving at its destination at 6.10 a.m. the following morning. This timetable reveals another curiosity. It was the very first to show the distance between Youngstown and Pittsburgh as 65 instead of 68 miles. The p &E's January 7, 1919 passenger timetable prints a general order of the Director General of Railroads dealing with discourtesy of railroad employees to the general public. Complaints have reached me, said this high official, that the employees are not treating the public with as much consideration and courtesy under government control of the railroads as under private control. Calling upon the authority of his office, he declared that the old public be damned attitude will under no circumstances circumstances be tolerated on the railroads under government control. Pullman service via the P&LE reached its peak in the early 1930s, when there were two P&LE sleeping cars for Chicago, two for Buffalo, and one each destined to Albany, Boston, Cleveland, Detroit, Toledo, Toronto, and St. Louis. Parlor cars shuttled between Pittsburgh and Cleveland on all through trains. And food service was provided by diners, or broiler buffet parlors. Through coaches ran between Pittsburgh and Detroit on both the day and night trains, and a coach for Chicago was offered at night. Rail trips to vacation spots and points of interest were actively promoted by the P&LE and other railroads in the pre-car age. P&LE's August 1st, 1927 timetable, for instance, sets forth the enticement of a circle tour from Pittsburgh to Buffalo, then to Niagara Falls, then on to Lewiston, New York, at the mouth of the Niagara River, where a boat would take the trip on to Toronto and the Great Canadian National Exposition. Excursions at reduced rates were common. From the earliest days of the railroad down to the time when faraway places became accessible by airplane. Like the Bessemer in Lake Erie, which had Conneaut Park, the P&LE had Aliquippa Park, some 20 miles down the Ohio River from Pittsburgh. Special trains were operated to and from the park and company outings were held there. And one accountant tells of an impromptu office picnic to Aliquippa Park being aborted in the nick of time when word reached Pittsburgh that President Newell, who tolerated no such thing, had arrived at Youngstown and was most definitely on his way to Pittsburgh. Lunch baskets were put out of sight and everybody was diligently at work when he appeared. Amtrak, the federally supported agency that took over selected passenger service throughout the country, did not pick up any service operated by the P&LE, nor any of the Chicago-Washington service performed by the B&O partly over P&LE tracks. The only passenger service that remained on the P&LE by the late 1970s was one commuter train, inbound from Beaver Falls in the morning and outbound in the late afternoon. Even this one train failed by substantial margin to meet out-of-pocket expenses.
was a revival of passenger usage in the 1940s during and following World War II. But by 1950, the number of passengers per year had tapered off to 1.25 million, about where it was in 1940. From this point on, the drop was steady year by year in both the number of passengers and the quality of service offered. The railroad then moved out about some 400,000 passengers in the year 1960, but by 1970, the number was only 71,000. In relation in addition to 1970s freight revenues of 35.7 million, the passenger revenue was less than 0.2 tenths of 1%. Now, could you maybe explain what this is for our viewers? Uh, all right. Does this come out in color? Yeah. All right. The, uh, the white lights indicate to the train dispatcher that he has a route lined up for a train to proceed through this interlocking. The little green light tells the dispatcher that he has a signal set up. There's something besides a red. It's a signal to proceed. The red lights indicate the train. That's the actual train as it moves along. As it moves along now when he comes up uh, to uh, 11Y here, these white lights will turn red. The green light will go out when he goes by the signal. And then as the caboose clears and the, the, the lights go dark. How many different trains do you have going on at one time? I mean, are there at one time give on, on the given board right now, let's say? Hey, what? There's a four-man program. Okay. Well, right now, it looks like there's only got about two on there. Manasco, Crescendale. So in other words, what he's actually doing is more or less what a uh, flight controller is trying to control tower. Right. He's keeping track, he's bringing them in then. Right, Until that's right. That's down. exactly what he's doing. And at times, this job gets awful busy. He could have as high as maybe uh, 15 or 20 trains, different trains on the railroad. But right now, it looks like there's only about two. Now, the controls that are on this panel, they do what? This, this is the, first of all, this is a, the, the display panel. This is where you see what's happening. This panel down here is where he makes it happen. This is, you see, notice the track diagram here is, is identical to what's on the display. This is what, where he makes it happen. He lines the signals up for the trains. You'll notice the, uh, some of the buttons he has blocking devices on these little uh, blocking devices. That's for um, if a track's out of service for some reason. Uh,